I've titled this sermon, Inspired on Dark Mountain, The Big Picture. And I want to share why having a big picture, an under, understanding of the universe and of ourselves grounded in our best science is our only way, I suggest to you, our only way of having realistic hope in chaotic times. Joel Primack and Nancy Ellen Abrams, they wrote a book called The View from the Center of the Universe. Joel was the guy who discovered dark matter. He worked out the mathematics in terms of understanding dark matter and dark energy. He's one of the leading cosmologists in the world. In fact, his theory is known as the double dark theory. They call him the dark lord. <laughs> in their book, The View from the Center of the Universe, they say without a meaningful, believable story about the big picture, we have no idea how to think about ourselves and our world. And without a big picture, we are a very small people. All cultures have had a story that tells them who they are, where they came from, how they got there, where things seem to be going, and how to live. It's a people's creation myth or cosmology. We have a cosmology grounded in our best evidence, our best scientific understanding of the universe, that also gives us not just reason to be alive and to be passionate and to be engaged, but it helps make sense of the chaos, the chaos and the challenges that traditional religious stories don't adequately explain. I was going to title this sermon, Confessions of a Recovering Techno-Optimist. <laughs> because Connie and I have been living, some of you know this, but for the last 13 years we've traveled North America pretty much non-stop, I mean a month or two at a time in a place, but oftentimes faster than that. We've spoken to 2,000 groups, including almost half the Unitarian Universalist churches in the country, about 500 Unitarian Universalist churches. And for the vast majority of that time, I was a techno-optimist. I believed that progress and that things would just keep getting better and better and easier and easier, and it was basically a trajectory from the caves to us to the stars. I certainly believe that technology will continue to play a significant role in human evolution and our relationship with the planet. And technology can help us actually become more intimate to pay attention to the problems that we're causing. So I'm not at all anti-technology. But I no longer am a te techno-optimist because one of the things we've also discovered is that technologies often provide more problems than they solve. And so I want to talk very briefly about how I got to Dark Mountain and what that means. Because there's a way of thinking about the history of everyone and everything that's inaccurate, which basically sees that everything leads to us. And we're the pinnacle, like, wait, ain't we bad? Like, we're the best, right? I suggest to you that that's a wildly inaccurate way. In fact, we now know that there are 25 civilizations just in the last 5,000 years. And most of them felt that way. That they were like the be-all and end-all. And guess what happened? We've discovered that civilizations and empires and cultures have this, are just like individuals. They're born, they mature, they grow old, and they die. All of them. Even civilizations that have held intact, for example, like China, has gone through a number of rises and collapses. Rises and collapses. Same thing with Egypt. There is no civilization that has not gone through this process. And so it's vital to understand our time, because if we don't know where we are in the process, we can be looking at chaos, looking at challenges, looking at difficulties, and we're going to be confused. In fact, some of the things that we're going to attempt to try to fix the problems are going to make things worse because what we're dealing with aren't problems that can be fixed. They're predicaments that have to be dealt with. They're predicaments that have to be lived with. They're predicaments that need to be adapted to. That's what evolution is all about. 
And so Connie and I just recently, this year in fact, just this year, we discovered the Dark Mountain Project. And it's a group of recovering environmentalists and recovering techno-optimists, artists, poets, storytellers, novelists, writers, who basically, well, I like the term, I'm an apocaloptimist. <laughs> because one of the two things that we see throughout history is two errors, two ways that people sometimes think that are both inaccurate. And there's tons of evidence that they're inaccurate. One of them, you could say, is the myth of perpetual progress. That things are just going to keep getting better and better, easier and easier, and it's like, again, like I said before, from the caves to us to the stars. The myth of perpetual progress denies that civilizations go through a life cycle. And that we are in that life cycle. I'll say more about where that is in a little bit. The other myth, though, and I mentioned this last month, I think, is the myth of the apocalypse. That we don't need to be engaged, we don't need to be involved, because the whole thing's going to hell in a handbasket. There have been two major resources. One was a book written by John Michael Greer called Apocalypse Not. And the other is a TV series in Canada done by Brian Paisley. Both of them, independent of each other, chronicled the 3,200-year history of end times thinking and showed the tragedies and the suffering that has resulted when people thought the end of the world was right around the corner. And so I'm not apocalyptic, but nor am I a techno-optimist that, you know, they'll think of something. Technology will save our butts. Okay, I'm an apocalyptimist. I think things are winding down. I think we are clearly in the contracting decades of the American empire. Do you know that 100 years ago, Nations were proud to say that they were pursuing to become an empire. Everybody wanted to be an empire because an empire takes resources from other parts of the world for their benefit. That's what nations love to do. Now we sort of like hide the term. But when 5% of the world's population in America take basically 25 to 30% of the world's energy and resources, that's basically what empires do. We're in the declining decades of the American empire. And we're in the declining decades and centuries of industrialism. So I want to just briefly paint the big picture on a hundred year time scale. Because I think this will help us understand where we are. Now, if you compress the history of the universe into a hundred years, you know, with the, the Big Bang or the Great Radiance, right, at like one second after midnight of the year zero, and right now, is midnight of the 99th year, just shifting into the 100th year. Because at that time scale, every decade is 1.4 billion years, every year is 140 million years, each month on this 100 year time scale is 12 million years, each week is 2.8 million years, each day is 400,000 years, and each minute is 250 years. So, just very briefly, at day two, the hydrogen and helium, early helium, was formed. Helium is also, of course, formed in stars. Okay, galaxies are formed at age 67, was when our solar system was formed on a 100-year time scale. At 69, Earth cooled below the boiling point of water, and it rained for eons, and the oceans formed. There were some icy comets, but that's basically when the oceans were formed. At 71, Earth comes alive, bacteria. Archaea, bacteria, form. And at 72, they learn to harness the sun. They learn to eat on the photons of the sun. And then there's this whole complexification of life. I'm not going to go through the details. At 87, the first major pollution crisis, which was when these creatures that were now putting oxygen, which was a toxic byproduct, that was their waste, <laughs> and things died all over the world, and of course, creatures evolved to eat that. What I want to do is jump all the way to December 15th of the 99th year. That's when the, the descendant or the, the, the ancestor, the common ancestor of humans, chimpanzees, and bonobos, December 15th of the year, 99th year, 
December 25th is Homo habilis, the first human species, Homo habilis. December 25th of the 99th year, that's when we started using stone tools. We domesticated fire, Homo erectus, on December 29th. At 3 o'clock in the morning on December 31st is the common ancestor of Neanderthals and Homo sapiens. That's when Neanderthals and Homo sapiens split. Now, we did discover recently that there was some interbreeding even in the last 60,000 years. In fact, Connie is very proud of the fact that she has 4% Neanderthal DNA. <laughs> We started speaking symbolic language, it's difficult to discern exactly when, but roughly around noon, about 200,000 years ago, most scientists would say, on December 31st of the 99th year, okay, this is the time scale. Seventy-two thousand years ago, which would have been 7 p.m., December 31st, is Toba, this super volcano in Indonesia that almost wiped out humanity. Less than 10,000 human beings in the entire world survived. We know this because of DNA, genetic testing. Supervolcanoes are very, very disruptive. Almost wiped us out. Um, at 9 p.m., we started cooperating at larger scales than just bands and families, tribes, basically, about 50,000 years ago. And for about 99% of human history, we survived and ate without in any way destroying the natural world, without doing damage to the natural world. Hunter-gatherers and horticulturists, and even early agriculture. The challenge is that we start shifting to forms of agriculture that started decreasing the health and vitality of the soil. And then we started running into trouble because we also started creating cities that are almost by definition living beyond the carrying capacity of their region. That is, they use more resources and they put out more waste than the region can sustain. And what happens, that's okay if you can go conquer another region or go, you know, find another region. In fact, one of the most fascinating things is that when Europeans discovered America, it was like a whole open continent of resources. So there was this abundance. This is very, very recent. So the last two minutes, on a hundred year time scale, the last two minutes, we started thinking of nature as a clock, because what happened was we invented clocks. <laughs> the problem is that did two things. It, it basically desacralized nature. Nature was no longer a vow to be honored and respected. Nature now was an it to be used and exploited by us. And it also trivialized God. God was no longer a synonym for reality. God was now a being imagined to be outside a clockwork universe that made this clockwork universe that you can either believe in or not. That was just in the last two minutes. We also had the concept of the supernatural. Prior to 500 years ago, there wasn't a concept <coughs> of the supernatural. There was the ordinary and the extraordinary. But like in your dreams, when you fly in your dreams, you're not having a supernatural experience. You're having an experience that we all have in the dream state. And the idea of being above and beyond nature, we don't find that, except in the last 500 years or so. Death, we only just in the last 500 years came to understand the absolute necessity of death in the universe. From the death of stars that create the periodic table of elements, I did a whole sermon on this last month to the death of molecules, the death of mountains, the death at all scales of the universe. To use religious language, God, that is reality, revealed that to us through evidence in the last 500 years. The last minute on the cosmic, two minutes on the cosmic century timeline. The other major thing that we're just now learning is that limits are real and limits are sacred if anything is. I consider the idea of limitlessness to the original sin. You know the story of Adam and Eve? It's not a story about disobedience, it's a story about dishonoring limits. Dishonoring nature's limits. And you take yourself off the path of paradise onto the path of hell when you dishonor nature's limits because we will, we will overshoot our carry capacity. And then there'll be a die-off. That's what happens in all species. There's no exceptions. 
The challenge is that we've now been in overshoot, probably since the Civil War. That is, humanity has now occupied the planet, and there's no more new places to go to. There's no, there's no more, more new continents to find. So we have to live sustainably, or we will perish. And the challenge is that over the course of this next hundred years, there's going to be consequences to be paid. Not because some supernatural being is pissed off at us and punishing us. It's because there are consequences we live, when we live out of right relationship to reality. And those of you that have heard me speak before know that when I use the word God, I am only and always meaning reality with a personality, not a person outside reality. And then finally, the notion of progress was sabotaged by becoming identified with what is in fact a demonic economic system that is based on the industrial rape of nature. This idea of progress, see there's anti-future progress and there's pro-future progress. I'm not against progress. It's just that if the natural world, if the health of the soil, the health of the forest, the health of the, the oceans is not improving decade by decade and we think there's human progress, we are so deceived. There is no human progress that doesn't include the getting better and healthier of the natural systems upon which we depend utterly. So let's take a look at the next two minutes on this cosmic central time. What, is there, are there any things that we can say confidently that we can expect in the next 500 years? This is where that quote from Joel and Nancy, when we step back and have a big picture, this can give us inspiration. It allows us to face the challenges you know, without being freaked out. First of all, there are certain things we can count on. For example, we know that Halley's Comet, every 73 years is going to come back. We can calculate for millions of years to the day that Halley's Comet will be, able, will be visible. Eclipses and things like this. So that we can count. Climate shift. We now know through evidence, again, from re what reality, whether you use secular or religious language for reality, I like to use religious language. So what God or reality has revealed through evidence, we now know that when the planet gets warmer, certain things happen. For example, in the West, things dry out. We're going to see climate patterns that we've seen lots of evidence in the past. That's why Connie and I fully expect in the next 10 to 15 years, could be the next five years, a mass migration out of California. They are running out of water rapidly, and they are likely to be in a centuries-long drought, not just a few years. Again, we gain this through evidence. So climate patterns are going to shift growing patterns, because it's kind of like global weirding. It's not just global warning. The jet stream is doing this now. We've had a really quite a nice summer here, haven't we? Had? I mean, it's been an amazing summer. Today's one of the hotter days. But Alaska has been baking. The Pacific Northwest, I used to live in Portland, Oregon, has been baking. The challenge is the jet stream has made the eastern part of the United States, which includes Washington, D.C., of course, colder in the last two winters. And so you, it just has fed climate denialism. Global warming, <laughs> bring it on, right? Here too, of course. Sea levels will rise at least 50 feet in the next two minutes on this time scale. The next 500 years, sea levels will rise at least 50 feet. I mean, it could be actually way beyond that. But nobody is saying that sea level won't rise at least 50 feet. Now, think about that. In 500 years, imagine people living 500 years ago. I mean, before there was all this infrastructure and buildings and toxins and all this kind of stuff, power plants, we're going to have to do a massive moving away from the oceans. Now, fortunately, we here have the best ocean in the world. Lake Michigan! <laughs> these inland seas, these sweet water, these freshwater inland seas are not going to be rising in the way that the uh, oceans are. Be very minimal. Mass migration in the next 500 years. A return to pro-future, multi-generational concerns about the meaning of life and the importance of sacrifice. 
See, it's so easy to focus on the bad stuff. We will be seeing localization, relocalization. Permaculture, that is horticulture 2.0, will flourish throughout the world over the course of the next 500 years. There's just no question. I mean, and I'm painting, I just want to let you know, I'm taking the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, I'm taking the, the best scientists of the world, the best case scenario. Worst case scenario is it's so bad there are no humans in 100 years. I don't think that's likely to be the case. I think we're going to mobilize as a species in the next 10 years like we did at the beginning of World War II. So I'm taking a look at the best case scenario. We're still looking at 50 feet of sea level rise in the next two minutes on this scale. We're still looking at growing patterns shifting. We're looking at mass migration, but we're also looking at permaculture spread all over the world. Pro-future forms of all the world's religions. There probably will be, 100 years from now, or 200, let's say 500, okay, we'll go to two minutes. There will probably be, 500 years from now, Christians and Muslims and Buddhists and Jews and Hindus. But they will be profoundly pro-future Hindus, pro-future Muslims, pro-future Christians. And they will value evidence as modern-day scripture. Within the next 500 years, I actually think it could happen in the next 50 to 70 years. We're already seeing it begin to shift radically in Pope Francis. Pope Francis already values evidence above ancient texts. This is absolutely clear. He doesn't use the word evidential reformation. He doesn't use the words evidence as modern day scripture, but that's exactly what it is. The greater authority for him is what evidence is revealing, not what ancient texts are revealing. And other major religious traditions around the world are doing this too. So this will happen in space. So I call it religion 3.0. Religion 1.0 is tribal, hunter, gatherer, native ways, living in right relationship with the natural world, and you perish. It's that simple. And they have personified, that is, they personified everything. They, we call it animism, but it was really a personified, an unconscious giving human characteristics to what's other than human, more than human. And we did that because that helps us live in right relationship. Religion 2.0 is the authority of the books. And we start thinking of God not as a personification of reality, but a person outside reality. Well, that has a very short shelf life. That one won't last much longer. We're already in the declining phases. I could do a whole program on what's happening to religions around the world. There are some. Islam is spreading... But forms of Christianity are in decline, and it's just that the liberals are declining faster than the conservatives. <laughs> but there will be pro-future forms of all the religious traditions, and eco-technic societies. In the same way that it took a while for the bugs to be worked out of our various ways of being human, technic societies, that is where we use energy, not just human muscle power and animal muscle power, but we also use, use machines we will have eco-technic societies long before the next 500 years. Now, let's look out the next hour, the next 17,000 years, or the next week, that is the next 2.8 million years. I believe that human beings will probably last as long as, maybe a little bit longer than most species, which is about 5 million years. We're a very, very adaptive species. No matter what happens, there's most likely going to be at least a remnant of humanity that survives and then repopulates over the course of, you know, thousands of years. So I think that's likely. And I think by the time some asteroid impact or super volcano does us in finally in the next, you know, two or three, four million years, when you step back and look at the whole of human history, I think 49.5% of it, that is from two and a half million years ago until about 10,000 years ago. We lived in right relationship to the natural world and the soil improved. The forests were not destroyed. And in this last 10,000 year period, we've been out of right relationship to reality. And the other 49.5%, once we make this through, which could take several hundred years at least, for the foreseeable future, humans will once again live. And the only reason I can say this confidently is the only other option is we will go extinct. It is impossible to live out of right relationship to God or reality, nature, for very long. It is impossible. 
Because as Pope Francis says, nature doesn't forget. If you slap it, it will slap you back. We have to live in right relationship to nature. And of course, I see nature as divine, as revelatory. Now, the final little piece on my 100-year timeline is that I think humans, like all the species, will go extinct. And sometime in the next 20 million years or so, raccoons will be the next self reflexive <laughs> intelligence because they have the manual dexterity, right? Yeah. And then one of my favorite authors, John Michael Greer, says the great existential crisis for the third self-intelligent species, because raccoons, their descendants, will only last, you know, three or four, five million, maybe ten million years, and then something like an asteroid impact will take them out. And the third self-reflexive intelligence is likely to be the descendants of the corvids, the crows. And the great existential crisis of the crows is that they will reach the moon and realize, because they're already into flying, right? And a and hundred million years from now, the oil reserves will, so they'll have concentrated energy in the form of oil, like we do now, right? right? So the great existential crisis for the crows, the descendants of the crows, which will look nothing like crows today, will be when they get to the moon and realize that some species beat them to it. And there will be a humility that comes with that, because they will realize that they too, their time is limited. So how does this story, what, what are some lessons? Well, I see five major lessons from big history, from this cosmic 100, 101 year time, because that's all I've done is gone out 101 years. That final year is 140 million years. So 101 years going out that next year is only 140 million years. This is the fact. This is the truth. So there are five lessons that I gained. The first one is that from a human's perspective, climate is God. There is no force on this planet that has more consistently created, sustained, and destroyed like climate. And climate has, until now, always been personified. So if the climate was going good, that was God's blessings. If the climate was going bad, God was upset. And I'm not saying we should get back into that interpretation, but I am suggesting that climate is God. Caring capacity is sacred. When a society or a civilization ignores or violates grace limits, that's, what I, that's a religious name for caring capacity, grace limits. When we ignore or violate grace limits or caring capacity, societies, all societies, contract and collapse or die. There are no exceptions. However, we've also learned that death is natural and necessary at all levels of the universe. As I spoke about last week, that civilizations have a life cycle just as individuals do. The only measure of progress that has any chance of being accepted by those in the future is the well-being of primary reality. Any form of progress that isn't about the health and well-being of the natural world first, and then humans secondary to that, is, is, a, is a way of thinking about progress that will not sustain. Our children and grandchildren will condemn us for those forms of anti-future progress. And then finally, this notion of pro-future versus anti-future. That's the main distinction. From now on, everything needs to be judged by whether it's pro-future or anti-future. All of our policies, our activities, our institutions, our voting patterns, our theologies. Is it pro-future? That is it leading to a healthier future? Or is it anti-future? Is it about en enriching the few at the expense of the many? Is it about how fast we can take nature and turn it into pollution? That's anti-future. So why do I look to the big picture? I'm going to conclude on this note. Why do I look to the big picture to find inspiration on Dark Mountain? Seven things. The first is that it provides a deep time, big family understanding. This is what we know from the universe story. It's this deep time that we are the universe becoming conscious of itself. We're not separate from nature. We're not separate from the universe. We are nature evolved to the place that the universe can begin to contemplate itself. We can, we can feel alienated if we have inaccurate worldviews. We cannot, in fact, be alienated. We are one with the universe, period. That's a fact. That's not a belief. 
And when I say big family, it's this, the, the children's story that I did, I think back in June with the kids, is that we are related to all creatures. Big family, deep time perspective. And what it does is it simultaneously nurtures trust, gratitude, but also grief and resolve. It's important to honor our sadness, to honor our grief. If the 20th century was the century of arrogance and pride, the 21st century will be the century of humility and grief. And that can be a really good thing. Our hearts soften. We feel our connection with other species and with other beings. I can trust. Another reason why I look to this big picture in terms of facing the challenges of our time, I can trust that our rapacious consumer society will fall of its own weight and then be nurtured by the feelings that arise from that. It blasts the dam of denial and clarifies both our predicament and our way into the future. So this perspective unlocks the evolutionary significance of religion and the religious significance of science. Let me say that again. This deep time, big family perspective given by science helps us realize the evolutionary significance of religion, because religion, if it's doing its job, is to help us live in right relationship to reality, but religion hasn't been doing that recently because of what I mentioned before last month, the triple idolatries, idolatry of the written word, idolatry of the otherworldly, and idolatry of beliefs. But fortunately, religion is being forced, really, back into an evidential understanding. And again, there are major players, including Pope Francis, who's, who's leading the way up. It helps me value dissensus. Dissensus is the, is the purposeful opposite of consensus. It's the refusal for premature consensus. It's basically saying we need a diversity of opinions, diversity of thinking, a diversity of, 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 of approaches, because we don't know which one the universe is going to bless. We don't know which one God, reality, is going to sort of feed. Again, I'm personifying here. But we're not going to know which one are going to create the conditions for that version to thrive. That's the way evolution happens. It throws out a number of possibilities, and then the environment selects one of them or more. So the valuing of dissensus, the valuing of diversity. I don't want you all to think like me. The fact that we think differently is a good thing. Our, think of the different organs in your body. They're all playing a different role. I mean, I don't know about you, but I would not want my anal sphincter cells and my heart cells to be doing the same thing. <laughs> the fact that they're doing different things is a really good thing for my health. This perspective also helps me accept that in the words of the Dark Man Mountain Manifesto, if you just put Dark Mountain Manifesto, you'll see why so many of us align with this perspective. It's up on up three online, but it says, the end of the world as we know it is not the end of the world full stop. It's simply the end of this way of being human that has been so destructive of the natural world. And finally, and I want to conclude on this note, because this is hopeful, it calls and empowers me, it calls and empowers us to what my great mentor Joanna Macy calls active hope. Not passive hope, but active hope. Active hope is hope that isn't about just waiting for something else to make a difference. There are four components. I'll make it real simple. To love something, to learn something, to let something go, and to carry something forward. In my own life, to love something. This summer, every, every once a week, I'm going down to this permaculture demonstration site, 45 minutes south of here, and I spend about four hours watering 400 baby trees. I'm loving these trees. I feel this parental thing going on with these trees. And it's been interesting. I was sharing this with Dave and Chrissy, is that I, I was sitting in their bay window there at the Red Barn, and all of a sudden I felt like the, uh, the grapevine was saying to me, Hey, what about... <laughs> so I've been out watering the grapevine too right? but I'm loving life I'm loving some specific beings non-human beings to so love something to learn something this year Connie and I have been immersing ourselves in the literature of the rise and fall of civilizations why civilizations do this 
So we've been learning, taking this on and learning as much as we can about this. So love something, learn something, let something go. The thing that we've let go of is that I only fly now if it's absolutely essential. If I have to fly or make a big leveraged impact. So I've now turned down a number of opportunities to fly. I'm flying less just because I want to reduce my carbon impact. And yes, I know that there are a number of other people on the plane. And I mean, I know all that stuff. It's just making one little decision to fly less, significantly less. The other thing that we've done is that we always, unfortunately here, we haven't had to use air conditioning at all. But in the, in the winter, we've been keeping, in the last year, year and a half, we've been keeping the heat three, deg three degrees lower than we normally would. And we just made that decision, and we, we've been doing it ever since. So love something, learn something, let, you know, let go of something, or, or, or you know, decrease your impact. And then finally, carry something forward. What I'm trying to carry forward is a healthy version of religiosity, a healthy version of God talk that's not otherworldly and supernatural, but it's undeniably real. And helping the, to whatever on the other side, say a hundred years from now, when there's probably going to be less than a billion human beings on this planet a hundred years from now, and it's not because of some major catastrophic die-off, most likely, it's just going to be because of drought and famine and difficult times and the fact that we're very quickly going to be in a post-antibiotic <coughs> age where antibiotics don't work anymore. These sorts of things will just, over the course of a hundred years, can decrease a population 90%, and I expect that. And yeah, I grieve that, because I know that my kids and grandkids could very well be among those who don't make it. To carry something forward is to say, is to take one skill or one set of knowledge and say, I'm going to do everything I can to ensure that this passes forward. So, love something, learn something, let go of something and carry something forward. Let us support each other in this process so that we're all inspired and inspire each other whether you consider yourself on Dark Mountain or not. We're going to deal with challenging times. And I thoroughly expect in the course of the coming decades to see 80% of the best of humanity to show up. Unfortunately, we'll probably also see 20% of the worst of humanity. That just comes with the territory.